Ed Ray is one of the greatest British entrepreneurs of our time. He's also a very nice chap. He went to Tunbridge School and then he went on to Oxford. Uh, after Oxford, his first job was with Shell. And after that, he went on to JP Morgan, where he became vice president in the derivatives market. So by anybody's standards, he was doing pretty well on his resume. Um, but it was nothing compared with what was about to come. In 1999, Ed went over to a drinks reception and he met this guy called Andrew Black, and during uh, their meeting, they exchanged this idea about a, a betting exchange, an online betting exchange, which basically took out the middleman so you could bet against each other. What's remarkable about this is that next morning, despite the fact they, had the, they talked about it at the drinks reception, they still remembered the idea, which is uh, one of the first rules to success. Um, secondly, they actually did something about it, and they launched it. It's a great thing that they did. As some of you will remember, uh, 1999 was at the peak of the dot-com boom. Uh, so you know, anybody who'd launched e-anything was doing very, very well. You had 19-year-old 19, 19 um, blue-haired kids driving around um, with lo lots and lots of money. It was a crazy time. Ed and Andrew went to try and raise capital uh, from the venture capitalists, and they raised absolutely squat, nothing, zip. Uh, all they got is slammed doors in their faces, which we'll talk about in a minute. But because of that, he didn't quit, didn't go and cry in the corner. They raised and they did a very innovative uh, funding round where they, he put some of his own money in. Uh, he got money from friends, family, and also some of the former traders that he knew. Um, and it's a great job that he did. It was worth the struggle because many of you know about Betfair, obviously, but just in terms of the size of Betfair today, Betfair does over 7 million transactions per day. Now, that arbitrary number, to put it into context, is bigger than the entire European stock markets combined. So, pretty big. In 2010, he floated the company on the London Stock Exchange for a £1.4 billion sum. If you do the maths, Ed still owns just about 11% of that company, a little bit more, so he's doing pretty well for himself. Um, he's been involved in uh, many ventures, including um, Funding Circle, which is revolutionizing the way that we all uh, generate uh, capital for our companies. And he's here with us tonight, and I'd like to ask you all to give a massive welcome and a round of applause to our special guest this evening, Ed Ray. <laughs> Excellent. It is quite bright up here. anyone out. Yeah. Good. You can see the front row, so you can do whatever you want at the back. If we can just talk for a minute about the personality of great entrepreneurs. Um, first of all, you have been very successful, as I mentioned in the introduction, both in a large corporation, but also in an entrepreneurial setting. And some people think they're very different animals, right? You, you can be suited to a large corporate, or you can be a little bit crazy entrepreneurial visionary in an entrepreneurial world. Can you be both? Can you be good at both, or are they very different? I think you can definitely be good at both. Um, I mean, I look back on my career at JP Morgan, and it was an enormous organization, not as enormous as it is now. Um, and it was difficult in one way to work out how you could influence that directly, which is why I ended up leaving. Um, but it taught me a huge amount about professionalism. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a fabulous place to work. It taught me to get things right and to do, you know, if you're going to do a job, do it properly. Yeah. Um, and a lot of those skills you take on, I took on you know, when I started Betfair. Um, I think in both you have to be passionate, um, you have to be perseverant. Um, you know, if you don't, if you're not, if you're not either of those in a big organisation, you get lost very quickly. And if you're not either of those in a in a small organisation, yeah. when you're starting it yourself, you'll fail. Um, and I always think about P's, you know, passion, perseverance, professionalism, and then people. And probably the one area I would say that banking didn't really set me up for at all, um, and probably why I wasn't particularly good at it was managing people. Right, okay. But yeah, you later on became the CEO of Betfair for four years, 1999, yep. 2003. So presumably you managed quite a few people then. Well, I did. I mean, but I, I, mean, I, you know, I was the founder, one yeah. of the two founders. So yes, I was the CEO to start with. Um, and if I'm honest, the people that we had in those early days were, you know, I didn't go looking for specific skills. I went looking for sort of common sense, yeah. uh, like-minded sort of attitude, people who are prepared to say, come on, let's do this. Um, yeah. 
and it was pretty small business. I mean, yeah. when I handed over in 2003, it was probably, I don't know, 150, 200 people. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't, you know, didn't really enjoy that kind of it, that okay. part of it. It's very different going from managing in a small business to managing in a large business. Some people do it spectacularly well. You know, Charles Dunstan's a good example of someone who's done it very well. A lot of people don't make that transition. Yeah. And yeah. you can still have a lot of the passion and the drive, but have somebody else do a lot of the key management stuff. That's very true. Delegation, good old delegation. Um, so being passionate is absolutely essential for, for yeah. any, any yeah. course that you're doing. Um, if we look at you, people like um, Biz Stone from Twitter, Mike Lynch from Autonomy, uh, Zuckerberg from Facebook. Do you think there's anything that they have in common in terms of the you know, world class entrepreneurs? Is there anything? I don't think I should be in that group, by the way. That's okay. very nice of you. Um, <laughs> oh, one, one, <laughs> one billion pound I, organizations. Not bad. Well, I think they're all very passionate about what they do. It's an yeah. overuse, you know, as I say, I, I overuse that word. Um, they're very confident in their vision for their business. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, Let's be clear, every entrepreneurial business, you get knocked back a hundred times. Mm. I once said to someone, you get knocked down a hundred times, it's a case of whether you can get up 101 times. Yeah. Um, and as you have to have that confidence. You have to have a little bit, I think, of a, of, of, you know, a, a railroad mentality. It's not just self-belief, but it's also, as I say, it's that combination of railroad per, uh, mentality and perseverance. Yeah. Uh, and I think if you look at all those guys, they've you know, struggled to begin with. Easy to look now and say it was all... Yeah, always plain sailing, but it won't have been at any stage. Yeah. You know, there were lots of setbacks. Yeah, and that railroad mentality that you said, I mean, that helped you, as I mentioned, about the venture capital um, funding. You didn't quit. You just decided to do it anyway and yep. work out how to do it. So tell us, first of all, just answer the question, if you can, about sort of why did these VCs say no to you and Andrew? Um, if I'm honest, I think they were exactly right to say no to us because we were two guys who had a clearly what we thought was a great idea, but we hadn't really thought about how we were going to implement it, how we were going to build it, anything like that. So first few conversations were, okay, what's the idea? That sounds very interesting. Now, how are you going to do it? And we probably started umming and ahhing, and you know, it probably didn't ins inspire a lot of confidence. Um, at the time as well, I mean, you know, it's difficult to remember back, 1999, everyone was sort of, you know, there were heady days. There was another company out there, Flutter, yeah. who had done a spectacularly good job at... Um, raising the amount of money, and a lot of yeah. people we went to said, "Oh, we've already seen this model. It's what Flutter are doing. So right. you know, you're second to the table. So no, okay. thank you." Um, but I have to say, it was the best thing I think that ever happened because it was the first. You know, you learn one of those lessons early on, and it's yeah. a pretty big lesson when nobody's going to give you any money to get going. Um, to then say, "Right, okay, how am I going to get around that problem?" Yeah, um, and we did it in a slightly sort of. Back yeah. to front work. Yeah. So, so a lot of entrepreneurs I'd have thought if they got knocked back down by the VCs, and sometimes people can look at VCs on a pedestal and thinking they're you know, the be all and the end all. If they say no, the business won't work. Did that knock your confidence at all? Or? Um, of course it does. I mean, you know, and you said I didn't go and cry in the corner. I'm not sure that's <laughs> necessarily true. But um, <laughs> yes, of course you go in and say, why can't they see it the same way that we see it? Yeah. And what are, we, you know, what are we missing? Because these are smart people. Yeah. Um, as I say, I think they they look for the idea and, and the sort of the very clear path to de developing it. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it made us a bit bloody minded and we said, yeah. well, fine, we'll, we'll yeah. go and show you. And, yeah. you know, uh, they turned down a lot of people and they should do because yeah. an awful lot of people go and see them. And I have bumped into lots of people who said, oh, I had this, you know, we had the betting exchange idea too, but we couldn't get any money for it. So we didn't go any further. Right. And I go, well, you know, <laughs> thank goodness we didn't do yeah. that. Just out of interest, Ed, um, have you met any of the people that turned you down and said, hi, yeah. I'm, yeah, must um, feel good? <laughs> yeah, and look, you don't, we, we all make lots of decisions that go wrong and lots of decisions <coughs> that go right, and I don't believe at all ever in sort of sitting there and saying, ha-ha. Yeah. I absolutely believe in saying, okay, what do we learn from, why, do, you know, why did I say no, why did I say yes, what did you learn from it? And, you know, I'm often quoted, I think, as saying that, you've got to make lots of mistakes to get things right because you learn a lot more from those mistakes. But yeah. Yeah, they've, always been, they've always been very helpful. And I mean, actually, we then did have a whole load of venture capitalists who came in to the, once yeah. we bought Flutter. So we, you know, I had the opportunity to work with them and a lot of them are very helpful. Yeah. Um, so can you just tell us uh, how you actually managed to raise the, I think, two million early on? Yeah, we, we, raised a, we raised a million pounds from friends and family. Um, and having worked in the city, I realized that there are two really key dates in about any banker's life. And the first of those is when they get told what their bonus is. And the second one is when they get paid it. <laughs> and they are about a month apart in, in many cases. So I made sure I was going to see people between those two dates. <laughs> so I knew that they, they knew what they were going to get, but they hadn't been given it yet, so they couldn't. 
spend it. <laughs> um, and then I also went to, I could probably have raised, you know, we raised a million pounds. I could probably have raised a lot of that from um, people at JP Morgan, but I actually went and I got one person on a trading floor in 10 different investment banks. Well, it was 10 then, but they, a lot of them emerged and a couple aren't around anymore. Um, so it's not 10 anymore. But I, with a simple reason, I thought, well, if I get one evangelist on each trading floor, then mm. they'll be able to sort of spread the word to, you know, a couple of hundred people on their trading floor. And it was sort of, you know, that kind of you know, network effectively to get it going. And we were lucky. EIS, which had just started then, was an absolute godsend for us. And so we raised a million pounds from friends and family. The day the money arrived was without doubt the most stressful day of my life. Um, and to this day remains that because I suddenly sat there and thought, okay, these are all people I know <laughs> and I've now got their money and I better sort of make it work. And it's silly little things like you can have a drink with someone three weeks afterwards and you're not quite sure whether they're happy to see you or whether they're going, well, why the bloody hell aren't you in the office, you know, working hard for my money? Um, <laughs> and it was, but it was great. I mean, you know, they were, they were very good to back us. Um, it got us going and without doubt the proudest and you know, most rewarding day of my life was when we were able to hand money yeah. back to them and say thank you for your belief in us. Yeah. Presumably when you see them for drinks now, it's, they're buying the champagne, I'm guessing. Well, they, <laughs> look, well, they, they've, done, they've done all right out of it. And yeah. I, as I say, yeah. I'm, I'm delighted about that. But they took a big, big risk with big it. Big risk, yeah. So if you, if you look at, uh, you mentioned the word failure in there. And, and when I did some research on you sorry, over the last few weeks, one of the things you do seem to be really pushing is this whole uh, notion of failure is good. Um, can you, and you told the, uh, the Direct magazine, you said, uh, we all need to have a bigger appetite for failure. So, Yeah, I, w I mean, look, I don't say failure is good in itself, but it, you shouldn't be scared of failure. Yeah. If you're scared of failure, you won't push yourself, you won't find out, you know, what's, you know, what you need to know. And yeah. it, I don't think I'm saying anything particularly controversial when I say yeah. you learn an awful lot more from when you get things wrong than when you yeah. get things right. Yeah. I absolutely believe that you know, it's easy to run a business when everything is going well. You really learn a lot about the quality of people running a business when things are going bad. Mm. Um, so what I think we can't afford to do is to castigate people for failing. Um, mm. And I think in this country, we're so much better at it now than we used to be. You know, everyone says, oh, the Americans, you know, they celebrate failure. They don't, but they celebrate what people learn out of it. And mm. we are starting to do that. And it's so true because, if you, as I say, if you don't get things wrong, you don't know. And when you get things wrong and then when you solve them, that is the most rewarding thing. And then you sort of think to yourself, well, the guys chasing behind have probably got to jump over that hurdle yeah. in some way too. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's more a case of saying don't be scared of it. If you're scared of it and you're worried about failing, you're not an entrepreneur. Okay. So um, you uh, once sent to the Telegraph um, when they were talking about why you do speak to entrepreneurs like you are doing this evening. Um, you once said, so, quote, uh, so much about entrepreneurship is about not being scared to give it a go. Therefore, as you hear somebody else talk about all the silly mistakes they made, it just empowers you and gives you confidence to say, maybe I can do this too. So, Ed, any particular big clangers or silly mistakes you can share? Uh, plenty. <laughs> um, I mean, I think, so early days, I remember when we had just bought Flutter um, and we put these two businesses together. You know, I'd spent quite a lot of money buying this business, relatively mm. speaking, and yet I was umming and ahhing, or we were umming and ahhing about spending you know, a few thousand pounds on a slightly bigger server. Yeah. These are the days when you had servers rather than the cloud. Um, and we very nearly screwed it up because we put these businesses together and you know, we were doing 12, they were doing three in sort of round numbers, and you put it together and suddenly the combined business is doing 20. So there was yeah. a huge explosion of growth and we weren't ready for it. And yet we'd sort of said this might happen. Mm. And it was we were just a bit too timid, and we should have we should have backed ourselves more there. Okay. You know, we were playing catch up. I think I learned through that that time, time is your most undervalued commodity. Mm. People talk about money, they talk about people. Time is a really really crucial commodity, and so sometimes you have to do things in a, you know, overly inefficient, expensive way, yeah. to sort of you know maximize time. I think the other thing, candidly, that we didn't do as we grew was recognize that people. Everyone has a natural ceiling, you know, ourselves included, and we probably weren't as good about sort of continuing to bring in the people that were going to take us to the next stage the whole time right, uh, okay. when, when we should have been. Okay. Um, I mean, they're, clangers. They're, they're sort of ongoing issues which you always face, I think. Yeah. Hiring people, and I was 
not particularly, you know, I think I wasn't particularly good at hiring people and I was mm. not particularly good at managing them. Um, but one of the biggest things I learned out of Betfair is, you know, if you hire 10 people, the chances are, you know, you're going to get at least 10 or 20% of those hiring decisions wrong. And that mm. means that there's one or two people in your organization who shouldn't be there, yeah. you know, minimum. And yeah. it's very difficult to get used to that. And yeah. again, now, you get that gut feeling when someone doesn't fit. And it's not because they're not a great person. It's just they don't fit in your organization. And, you know, once you get that gut feeling, you need to act on it. Yeah. And Richard Koch, who's an author, is a, uh, the author of the 80-20 principle, believes that in, and also an investor, obviously, in Betfair with 6.5%. But he's a belief is that, you know, in every 100 people, you're going to have 20 star performers, 20 rubbish. But you just have to let go of the rubbish people. Well, not the rubbish people, but the, the people who don't fit, as you say. Yeah, there, and there are two quickening. things. One, you know, you will hire some people who just don't fit from day one. Uh, and you need to sort of recognize that. Yeah. And sometimes it's hard, but it's a bit like, you know, in the sporting analogy, a manager who goes and spends, <coughs> you know, twen tens of millions of pounds on a striker who doesn't then score goals. Do you sit there and say, I've got that wrong? I'm a Chelsea fan, so I know all about that. But, um, <laughs> and, um, you know, sometimes you just got to say, look, that was a bad mistake. I've got to, I've got to cut it. Yeah. The other one, and I think this is a harder one, is you are surrounded by people who are fabulous, who've done a brilliant job for you. But as the organization grows and grows and grows, mm. they reach their ceiling and they're not the right people to take it forward. That's a much harder one because six yeah. months ago you were saying, these people are the best people, I couldn't have a better team. Yeah. You know, and now you're saying, actually, I'm beginning to think that maybe I've got to upgrade. Uh, yeah. And that's, that's a tough realization. Um, yeah. Again, one that it took me a long time to get my head yeah. around. How, how do you manage that if you've got a department head that was great at this stage of the business and then not so great? You just have to... I, you know, again, a much, a much overused phrase, but you know, great people will hire people who are better than them, yeah. or bring, you know, and they will sort of stretch themselves. Yeah. Average people will hire people who are worse than them to make themselves look good. Yeah. Um, and I think that's absolutely <coughs> spot on. So, mm -hmm. you know, you will have you will have those conversations. People will, will have a certain, you know, they'll reach their sort of natural limit. What tends to happen is that if you're not careful, as the organisation grows, so the job responsibilities for every individual in that organisation grow with it. And what you should do is say, okay, if this person is not up to it now, I've got to replace that person. But too often, and we did this the whole time, you bring in someone to help them and to work alongside, and then yeah. you tend to have two you know, good but not brilliant people when you should have one brilliant person with yeah. all the associated complexity of a, of a large organisation. What I also find is that every time you speak to someone and have that conversation, it's never a surprise. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you know, both people track. are sort of sensing that something's probably right. not working. Yeah. But as I, say, I wasn't very good at it. That shows good management, transparency before the big, the big conversation. Um, just quickly um, about Richard Koch as well, because he did say he's an investor in the, in the business, as you know. Um, but he did. We interviewed him on on Leaders In, and he did say that what was interesting about the the management team early on in Betfair is that there wasn't that much expertise in the betting industry, and it obviously it, it didn't end up mattering. But would you advise entrepreneurs to, that they can just launch? into any industry without having a deep-rooted knowledge in that sector? Um, well, we have, I mean, don't forget, Andrew, which, you know, my co-founder, was a professional gambler, so he knew a thing or two about betting. He wasn't, a, you know, <coughs> entrenched in the industry per se. Yeah. I think you can, as long as you know, you know, as long as you recognise where you don't know and, and you know, <coughs> plug that. And you've got to be very careful not to believe your own hype the whole time. Yeah. And we came out here, we had a great idea, the best thing that ever happened to us, well, one of the best things, was when the existing competition very obviously rubbished our idea, mm. and we could exploit that. And at that point, we knew we had something, <coughs> because the more they tried to rubbish it, the more we thought we were hurting them. Okay. Um, and we exploited that in the very simple way that you know, the bookmaking relationship with most bookmakers is quite adversarial. If you lose, the bookmaker wins, and vice versa. Yeah. And so we exploited the whole, my enemy's enemy is my friend issue and, and suddenly people are saying well if the bookmakers don't like these guys and we don't like the bookmakers then we, we should probably like these guys and we and we use that to our advantage but there comes a point where you've got to have industry expertise you know and, and yeah. you either build it up yourself or you or you have to bring it in yeah um you mentioned their competition just very quickly if we can get touch on this and then um it's interesting, Flutter did launch at about the same time as you. They raised 44 million in VC finance. Uh, you managed to get around 2 million in Angel through friends. And, uh, but you absolutely annihilated them. I'm going to quote um, a guy called Analgo from efreebets.com, which is a, you know, a, a portal. And he said, at precisely midnight last Sunday, a small piece of cyberspace winked out of existence. They closed down the server, pulled the plug from the socket, and that was the end of Flutter.com. So how, despite the fact that they had so much VC, did you win? And what lessons can we learn about annihilating whoever our own competitors are? Um, so we executed better. Um, so you know, people used to say it's first mover. 
um, and I think it's first good mover. And, and one of the mm. things that Andrew, to his credit, absolutely got was the key, you know, liquidity and just making sure that the site did what it was meant to do. And it was very functional for, he understood what the punter was after. He, he was, a, as I say, an ex-professional gambler. I used to bet a bit, you know, a number of us used to bet a bit. Uh, and I think we had that domain, you know, we had more domain of that domain expertise <coughs> than they did. We were lucky. We got ahead early. We, yeah. we hit the right formula first. And once we were out there, then it's quite hard to sort of chip away. When we mm -hmm. realized that they were, you know, going to be able to copy and things, we then said, okay, well, let's put these businesses together. Yeah. And I'm very glad we did because I think if we hadn't have done, we'd have spent an awful lot of time fighting them. Yeah. They, would they were absolutely <coughs> getting things right. Um, what we then did, though, which I think was smart, when we put them together is we just were quite brutal about saying, right, we're going to shut one down and concentrate everything into the, okay. into the surviving entity. And yeah. that was, you know, again, I think it's easy to say now, but it's quite difficult to do at the time, but that was yeah. definitely a key ingredient of the success yeah. of that deal. And you put their CEO as your CEO, is that right? Well, we brought their CTO in. David okay. came in as CTO uh, and then eventually became CEO of Betfair. Yeah. If, I had, if I'm honest, if I had my time again when we did that deal, <coughs> I would have been much more pragmatic about taking more good people from there and letting okay. some good people go from Betfair. I think it was, un, you know, you've got to understand, we had grown up for the previous year hating these guys yeah. with passion. Yeah. You know, they, we had pictures on the wall that we didn't quite throw darts at, but, you know, they were sort of, yeah, very, we were very focused on sort of this is who we're going <coughs> to... We've got a beat, and then suddenly you say, "Let's put the businesses together." That's quite difficult to do. Yeah. And I was, we were probably too loyal to some yeah. of the Betfair people, who, in retrospect, we should have said, "There's okay. a better person over there, and we'll bring yeah. them in." Luckily, that, with David, we did bring him in. That gladiatorial spirit of annihilating competitors is not a bad energy, is it? No, if it's no. if it's channeled if it's channeled properly. Okay. So, you know, being being aware of your competition is very important. Um, being you know, but but you don't want to get into being. Um, Sort of, I'm trying to think, sort of vitriolic and, and sort yeah. of just saying, I want to go after for the sake of going after. Um, we've got about another 10 minutes and we're going to open it up to the floor. So, first of all, some entrepreneurs want to, you know, run companies that are lifestyle businesses and, you know, they just want to generate some cash for themselves and just not have a boss, probably. Mm -hmm. uh, others want to build the next Twitter, Google. So let's assume for a second, looking at the next camp, if you want to build a billion pound company, a billion pound company, what are some of the, you know, top two or three things you've got to have? Got to have a lot of luck. Um, you know, I've gone through the, the, the yeah. passion, perseverance, professionalism. Um, hire good people. Um, I think today there's a huge advantage that you can test things and you can learn things really quickly. Believe what you read. Don't you know, if, if you put all your energy into one decision and it doesn't work out or it doesn't do what you expected, then believe that rather than sort of convince yourself that somehow yeah. you know, the, the data and everything else is, is wrong. Um, uh, and my key mentor in all of this is find a reason to say yes, not a reason to say no. Yeah. Um, yeah. And too often, as you get bigger and bigger and bigger, you can find more and more reasons why you want to not do something. You know, make decisions. If they're the wrong decisions, then go back and change them. But a yeah. wrong decision is better than no decision. Yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. Because it builds momentum well, going it forward. Just, because it's because actually by making being prepared <clears throat> to make some wrong ones, you'll also make a lot of good ones. Yeah, and you'll move forward. If you once get into the habit where you you don't make decisions, yeah. everything slows down, you have a meeting, you come back, you say, oh, okay, that's interesting, let's come back to that next week. Yeah. What's the point of the meeting if you're going to come back next yeah. week, have the meeting next week, and, yeah. you know, et cetera. Yeah. And it just slows down, as I say, time. You know, if you look at all of these great businesses, I mean, just look at how incredibly mm. efficient they've been about mm. just releasing things, killing them when they don't work. You know, yeah. Google didn't start out making any money from, you know, from search. It's sort of, you know, yes, it was a search business, but it hadn't worked out how it was going to make yeah. money. You know, the whole sort of, you know, it worked out that I'm going to sort of, sort of do pay-per-click and then I'm going to buy this in. You look at eBay, completely changed its business model. Um, Facebook changed its business model quite yeah. significantly. So none of these guys sort of just said, this is how I'm going to do it and stayed there. They were continually yeah. evolving their business yeah. and doing so in real time. It was we interviewed uh, Sir Stuart Rose, uh, obviously former M&S, and we talked about earlier now, chairman of Ocado, and he's, he said that one thing. He said, you know, the key thing you've got to do is make sure your business is moving forward. It's like a, it's like a bicycle. If it's not going forward, it falls over. Um, <laughs> talk about the testing that you just mentioned there. Perfect, in other yep. words. I, I think it's huge. Um, and again, I think today, we've got so much more advantage. You know, you can, uh, you know, user groups, there's one user group that counts, and that's the user group out there. Yeah. So put stuff out there, see what comes back, and then, you know, just you know, adjust accordingly. Yeah. Um, 
bear in mind that you never quite, you know, however much you think you know, mm. if you're trying to, you know, if you've got to, if you're going to develop one product to 100%, that's what you think is 100%. Well, do you really know that, or do you want your users to tell you that? And actually, 80-20 rule comes in. You can probably do five products to 80%. Yeah. Stick them out there. Say, okay, that one's clearly they love, yeah. and you know we <laughs> couldn't invest in this one's an absolute dog. Yeah. So I'm going to leave that one. Now, if that was the one that you had chosen to begin with, you spent all your money on that one, all your yeah. time on that one. Yeah. You launch something that's fallen flat you in its do, face. So yeah. getting things out there, you know, in a rough and ready state. Don't miss, you know, don't miss deadlines. Just get your users to to help. I mean, it's a very tech orientated. Um, Comment obviously, but you know, you they are your biggest and most valuable resource. Yeah, absolutely. And there's no excuse in this. It's quite easy and cheap to put things out into the Correct. marketplace. It costs you absolutely nothing. And yeah. you know, you've got so many platform tools there to do it that you know you can get yeah. feedback. You launch something, you can get feedback on it pretty much in real time. Yeah. You know, we would launch a product and we would know within 24 hours whether we got it right or wrong. The challenge then was when we got it wrong was convincing people, okay, we got it wrong, yeah. now we've got to change it. The other thing, obviously, that you've done it very, very well is you've ridden technological trends. And so um, seeing trends in the market, you know, horizon, all the big companies are riding big trends. So um, what do you see, Ed, as some of the big, you know, we've had social media, we've had mobile, well, we haven't had it, but we're in the process of the mobile revolution, if you like. What, what do you think are some of the ne next things on the horizon that are going to be super cool that we're going to be talking about? Um, I, I think disintermediation continues. Um, I think if you, you know, I, if you go right back, I often say go back thousands of years to look at how you would want to do something thousands of years ago. And you know, often we've put in place these very inefficient structures. So banking is one, mm -hmm. betting is another. We suddenly invented these ideas. I mean, why do you need a bank other than to sort of you know, facilitate people handing money to each other and then keeping yeah. it safe? Well, you could argue that actually now technology allows us to facilitate putting money together directly mm. and you can keep it safe in different ways. I'm not sure the banks necessarily keep it safe anyway. Um, so all the time, it's actually, if you go right back to first principles and design something, if you wouldn't design it the way it is today, then that market is absolutely ripe for innovation. Right. So, you know, you see that with, with social networking. It's just, well, we all like to keep in contact, and it's a way of doing it, and technology yeah. allows us to do it. Um, so I think finance, I think, you know, clearly anything where you have a virtual commodity, and finance is effectively a virtual commodity, yeah. allows you to do that. I think insurance is absolutely ripe for, yeah. um, you know, for disintermediation, and therefore innovation. Um, I think you will, you know, mobile has still got a long way to go. I think location has got a huge amount of you know, way to go. Yeah. Um, you know, new generation today are totally comfortable giving yeah. up pretty much all their information about what they're doing when. Yeah. The other one I think to look out for is where you take online technology and apply it in the offline world. So mm. you know, we've spent a lot of time over the last 15 years looking about what you can do online yeah. and the ability, how you can get to know your customer. and. There'll be some, you know, there are some very smart businesses now that are turning that back the other way and saying, well, actually, offline is still a much bigger part of our, of our world and let's use some of those techniques there. So, for example, you know, you've all got your mobile phones on. Your phone is the whole time looking for a network. It's the whole time looking for a, a Wi-Fi network. Yeah. So there's a very you know, there's a clever business out there right now that puts little boxes in retail shops so it actually knows when your phone walks in, how long you're in the store for. It doesn't know it's you but that's actually quite easy to do later on. But it knows you were here last Thursday for two hours. It knows you're here now. So those kind of things that you're going to get a lot more, you know, the two coming together. Yeah, online, off, offline integration, yeah. the good old real world. Um, are you going to do all of these yourself, I'm presuming? <laughs> All of it, yeah. <laughs> but if we can just talk, if we just talk about obviously uh, crowdfunding, and uh, the one thing you have been involved in uh, very recently is Funding Circle, yep. which uh, has raised over 150 million pounds, obviously for uh, companies uh, in the UK. Best week last week, so congratulations on that, sir. Can you just tell us a little bit about um, Funding Circle? So Funding Circle is what is loosely called sort of well, they loosely call it peer-to-peer -peer finance, um, but it's really crowdfunding for SMEs. So SMEs traditionally would go to their bank manager and say, I need to borrow £50,000 up to £1 million, whatever it is, for working capital to buy a piece of equipment or whatever. As we all know, banks aren't really lending. Yeah. Why do we need a bank there? We don't really. So actually, we go to all of us, the crowd, and we lend directly to the business. And it runs a simple auction. And, and I think the key question, if I asked anyone in this room, do you have a bank account? Everyone would put their hand up and say, yes, I do. If I said, have any of you lent, have any of you lent to businesses? A few of you might have lent through funding circle or something like that, but most of you probably wouldn't put your hand up. And I would argue you should, every single one of you should put your hand up because your money right now is going to businesses through banks, or has been, but you have no control over that. So all we've done is take out a very inefficient middleman mm. and allow people to talk directly to businesses. So, you know, it's mm. 
it's obviously a great time because you know, banks have struggled, and you know, I'm not knocking the banks the whole time. They've got lots of challenges they've got to fix, um, but businesses are desperate for this kind of cash. The key is it takes five months on average for a small business to raise money from a bank. Yeah. It takes anything from three hours to a week for them to do it on funding circles. So it's a much better and much more efficient process. And it will never replace banks, but <coughs> it will absolutely establish itself as, a, you know, as another means of businesses raising money. And this is just about uh, the British government and the lack. I know this is a passionate uh, area for you. Um, and you told The Telegraph back in 2010, one of my passions is how we foster entrepreneurship in this country. Right now, we're not doing a very good job. We could do better. And this is obviously when we had uh, Darling and Brown um, involved. Is, are we doing a better job now? First question. And the second part of that is, do you think this country has a sort of a, because we're beating up the bankers uh, so much, or sometimes even those that are high, high net worth individuals, do you think we've got a problem deep rooted in the psyche with success? Um, so I think we're doing a much better job now. Um, you know, we've, we've made raising, you know, things like EIS and then CDIS, which are fabulous um, mechanisms for raising money for small businesses to do it. Um, we have removed a lot of the red tape. There are still plenty more that we could remove. So I think it's a whole load more entrepreneur friendly than it was. Um, I still think we are, you know, we sort of say we want all these people to create all these amazing businesses, yeah. but I think we probably are still slightly shy of what we're going to do when we have a few of those people wandering around doing it. We absolutely mm. have the kernels of some fabulous ideas here and some brilliant businesses. What we've not done well enough yet is take them into the sort of, you know, the mega stage of a Google, Facebook or whatever. I yeah. think we are getting better at it. I think the, uh, the concern I had coming out of 7, 8 w was that people were going to confuse excess with success. Yeah. And we should be absolutely encouraging people to be successful and yeah. to, you know, to create, you know, wealth. If they create wealth for themselves, they can create wealth for the economy as a whole. Mm. And that's really important. And when they do that, we should not then suddenly turn around and, you know, make them evil because they've yeah. been successful doing it. Yeah. Um, but I think we are whole, you know, so much better than we were doing this you know, three years ago, five years ago. I mean, we're definitely going in the right direction. And I think within Europe, we absolutely have the, the most exciting stuff happening here yeah. than, than any of the other Europe. It's a long-term prospect for us being here in the UK with China, India, new disruptors out there in the marketplace. Is bullish? Yeah, because I, I mean, yeah, I think we have, I think we've got some incredibly smart people. I mean, we've got a fabulous university system here, and there's a lot of incredibly good ideas that come out of our universities that I don't think we are commercialising as well as we could. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's where we've got a you know huge er er well that we can tap into. Okay. Plus, I think as I say, we five years ago people didn't want to become entrepreneurs, or ten years ago they didn't want to become entrepreneurs. Yeah. Now it's the most you know, yeah, pretty much the most popular career decision there is. I think. Yeah. You think that's because of Dragon's Den and The Apprentice? And no, I don't, actually. I think they're all... I think... <laughs> don't get me going on them. I, they're good on the one hand, they're awful on the other because they create a completely unrealistic, um, mm. a, you know, sense of what it's like running a business. The yeah. whole, you know, you're fired thing is... You know, it makes for great TV. Yeah. It doesn't make for running great businesses. <laughs> um, so now we're going to do um, some questions. Um, so we've got two people with microphones, I believe. OK, is there any, any questions... Thank you. Uh, Tim Whiting from Little Brown Publishers. Um, technology has is, is, is obviously uh, been a great facilita facilitator of uh, on entrepreneurship. In, in your own case, do you think that had there not been a kind of uh, a new wave of technology that allowed you to, to, to change an industry, uh, you would have done something similar? I mean, was it what did it, did, were you kind of ready made to make that kind of jump anyway? Um, I, don't, gen I don't know. I mean, I been doing investment banking for eight years and was a bit bored of it. So I actually took a sabbatical and went to see my boss and said I want to take six months off. Um, and while I was on that six months and I started sort of work on this, um, I always felt that I wanted to know. I mean, again, it's that sort of fear of failure thing. If I'd have done it and failed, I'd said, okay, I'm not cut out to do that. And I might decide to go and do it again. But at some stage, I'd have said, okay, I don't want to do it. But at least then I'd have answered that question. So I think I would have wanted to do something. Um, I'm not sure what it would have been. <coughs> I've always been sports mad. I've always been a bit of a geek. You know, I read engineering at university, and and so from those point of view, it was an obvious, you know, business to um, to sort of get involved in. Um, and I think one of the things that really interested me at the time is that people. One person said to me, when you're looking at these ideas, if it's an internet business, and I think it's still true today actually. 
you know, had the idea appealed 100 years ago, but you couldn't do it 100 years ago because you, know, you didn't have this thing, and now the internet's enabled you to connect together and it works, those are going to be the great internet businesses. And I think that's true. If you look at all the ones that have been successful, they absolutely have to have the internet at their heart. Without it, they don't work, and that's why they've been successful. So you know, I, that's what got me excited by it. But. Uh, gentleman just back here. Hi, Jonathan Sim from Amazon. Quick question about disruption. Could you tell us more about um, you know, dis disruptive business models as well as how that's influenced your business? I love the idea that someone from Amazon asked me that question. But, uh, <laughs> um, I mean, to me, a disruptive business model is just a natural evolution. And the best, you know, when you, the great thing about a disruptive business model, you look at it once it's being created and everyone goes, it's, it's blindingly obvious. Um, and I go back to that idea about, you know, why we, sometimes we do things today the way we do them because we did them that way yesterday. And the great disruptors <coughs> of the people who suddenly say, well, actually, just because we did it yesterday doesn't mean to say it's the right way to do it today. I think the key is that, you know, that, that trend will never, will never change. One of, the, one of the things I used to say to everyone at Betfair was, if we can go up one side of the mountain, you know, this fast and disrupt and, you know, basically steal everyone's lunch, then we can sure as hell come down the other side twice as fast as everybody steals our lunch. And so you, you just, you know, by definition, we don't know where the next one's going to come from, but you've got to be alive to it and you've just, you know, you've got to think about how people can, can shift to it. I think, as I say, to me, the best business ideas come out of when you're going about your everyday life and you come across something and you say, this just irritates me why I do it that way. You know, it's not about sitting there in a dark room trying to have that light bulb moment. It's actually going, this is just not working as well as it should do, and then getting off your backside and saying, oh, so I'm going to change it and, and do it. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes disruption is a massive step. More often, it's actually inc lots of incremental steps, and then suddenly you go, gosh, we've completely changed the way things work. Um, I'm Ruby from Wired Magazine. Um, quick question. We constantly engage with entrepreneurs and startups in the magazine looking at how they've become successful and a lot of the themes that you've talked about, a failure and having to keep going, come up all the time. Um, but at the moment, I'm focusing on a project with young entrepreneurs, so age between 12 to 18, and there's a surprisingly large number of them out there who are doing incredible things. And I just wondered, from your point of view, if you had one piece of advice to give them as as they're growing and as they're kind of moving into a new space, what would that be? They're so lucky because they haven't really thought about what might go wrong, um, which, is, which is actually fantastic, and that's just incredibly, you know, liberating for them. So I would just say, if you think you want to do it, do it. You know, try it. If it fails, so what? There's no shame in failing whatsoever. Um, and I think it's just giving people the courage to go, this is what I want to try and do, I'm going to try and do it. And seek out lots of, you know, don't be afraid to ask other people what they did. Don't be afraid, don't be afraid to, you know, use what other people have done. There's no point in reinventing the wheel every single time. Um, and there's no shame in looking at what people do well and saying, I'll take a bit of that and a bit of that, and then putting it together with what you've come out with. But most of all, it's just go for it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us. Ed, as you can imagine, gets invited to do a lot of things. Um, we were absolutely delighted, obviously, when he, uh, he said yes to doing this. And he's been absolutely phenomenal with his time, sharing some great insights. And so if you can all join me in just saying thank you to Ed. Thank you very much indeed.